Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Paul Shapiro as the guest for today's episode. Paul Shapiro is the author of the national bestseller, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. He's the CEO of The Better Meat Co., a four-time TEDx speaker and the host of the Business for Good podcast. We're excited to have Paul Shapiro back on the show. This will be his second episode on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Anita Brellex and I went down to the Better Meat Co. HQ to record this episode in person. Please share this podcast with anyone that you think might be interested in cultured meat or future food technologies. Let's jump right in. We're excited to be here. So first, I actually want to just ask, uh, where are we, Paul? Well, Alex and Anita, it's awesome to have you both at the Better Meat Co. You are sitting in North America's largest mycoprotein fermentation facility for whole biomass mycoprotein, and we're in West Sacramento. But I got to say, I'm very excited to be on the show, not only because I am a religious listener of every single episode of the show, but I thought that I was the first guest on the show ever, way back in early 2018. Upon going and looking at your show history, I realized I was not the first. Sadly, I was not even the second, but I was the third. The third. And so I got for myself here my own medal. (laughs) I'm number three. I know I'm not number one. I'm number three. There we go. So I am three, and I presume, I don't know what episode this will be, but many, many later. This will be almost episode 100. Amazing. Yeah. Jeez, you all are prolific. Well, I'm proud to be number three. That's good enough in my life. Episode number three, but debatably, depending on the platform you look at, potentially number one based off of views or listens. Oh, well, of course. How could so. that be otherwise? <laughs> of course. No, I'm, I'm very psyched. I love the show. You guys have been wonderful providing this as a resource for the entire alternative protein industry, and it's really useful for people like me and so many others, and I'm sure it inspires a lot of people to get involved in the space, either as an employee or a founder or an investor. It's really a great resource. So I express my gratitude to you all for doing this show. Thank you. And you know, when we first actually set out to start the podcast, you were one of the first people that we reached out to. Great. And the first person to respond, at least respond positively. And after you <laughs> responded, we thought, oh man, Paul Shapiro, author of Clean Meat, like this industry is going to be booming and they're very welcoming. Like they, as in like everyone that was in the industry, which at the time, really funny to think that there were not enough cultured meat companies or even like profiles for us to profile. So that's when we expanded to like cultured meat and future food. Ah, I'm really glad yes. we did, but now it's, I that, mean. <laughs> that's how you've gotten to 100 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> you have to expand it out just not to be cultured meat only. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> There's also another difference. In addition to three years time passing, which for me basically means I have like sadly less hair on my head and more hair on my chest. I don't know why that happens. It's something like with evolution that causes that. I don't know why. But in addition, uh, we were all uh, non-married people back then Mm, at the beginning, and now we are all married people. (laughs) So I noticed that you are wearing a wedding ring, as do I. That's right. And so congratulations to you and Anita. Right. And Anita is actually behind the camera making sure everything is working smoothly. So we'll give a wave over to Anita right now. Thank you, Anita. (laughs) So uh, I want to get to kind of the facility and exciting news about RISA in, in just a second, but... I kind of first want to go back to to what we were just talking about, right? So, um, you know, we reached out to kind of see what's going on in the industry to see if we could even start a podcast. We were really excited excited to hear back from you. And and actually, a lot of the subsequent episodes were from your connections, such as Lisa Feria from Straight Out Capital and definitely a few more. Um, And it was... So it was this event that we went to. I think you had invited us, and I think Cyrus was there too, to an event in San Francisco. It was called World Fair Nano, I think. Yes, yeah. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is so cool. Paul has been on the show. Now we get to meet him. And, And that was a really exciting moment for us. And I think what was, for me personally, what was interesting at that show and I don't know if you remember this, but we were at the show and then all of a sudden you directed your attention to the ceiling. And I was thinking like, whoa, what, what's going on? And there was a bird and there was a bird that was trapped. And there was a lot of people and a lot of booths and a lot of kind of commotion underneath that bird. And the bird definitely seemed distressed. 
and that was at one time that was the first time i kind of noticed like you know we we should like you're very compassionate right and about different animals and i think um that to me was one of the first indicators that you know the different people in this industry you're yourself included in your background uh, very much care about everything that's going on in the world and, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you remember that. Like, you never know what impact uh, events will have on your life. And in fact, I was talking with a woman um, just a couple of days ago who um, just a random chance encounter with somebody in Whole Foods ended up leading her to a dramatic, I mean, she went from being a meat consumer to being a vegan to starting her own company. And now she's running her own vegan fried chicken company with $5 million a year in revenue just wow. a few years later. Like, because this random event. And with that event, I remember that bird because the, the bird could not get out through the roof. And admittedly, the sides were open, but the bird just, there were too many humans or like hundreds of us down there. And this bird just couldn't get out. And I, I felt very distressed uh, for that bird. And uh, I think most people don't really look at the world through non-human eyes. Like we just look at the world through human eyes and we just think, obviously, we're the only animal that matters. In fact, we don't even think we're animals. We, we separate animals from us, even though, you know, we say we believe in evolution, but we like to still uh, distinguish ourselves from all the other animals by putting us up on some pedestal. But, you know, we've taken over this world and we have affected a huge portion of it. And I always try to do things to uh, make life a little bit less, uh, less difficult for other animals. So even at Better Miko, you'll notice we have uh, bird baths around. We have bowls of water for the turkeys outside. Um, despite being a food production facility, we do not have lethal rodent control. We use other types of uh, prevention methods and we have in the rodent traps where they can come in and go out of instead of poison, it's uh, immunocontraceptives for them. So uh, they will not have babies. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can engineer our own world to be a little bit less harmful to the rest of the animals with whom we share the planet. And I think it's interesting to think about that yeah. in you know, we have all these kind of methods that are a little bit harsh right now, but if we do kind of change the way we go about the way we do kind of traditional things, you know, we can still achieve the same goal, but in much better ways. Yeah, well, just to use the rodent example, we don't have any problem with rodents here. Like we, we don't, they're not here because we're mainly engaged in preventive measures. But I think also, you know, you contemplate uh, just to go to the meat example, um, you know, I'm not the first one to say that most people don't eat meat because animals were tormented and slaughtered for it. They eat meat really in spite of that fact. Uh, they eat meat because they enjoy eating meat. They like the experience of eating meat. And so we need to find ways to replicate that experience for people that gives them the same amount of enjoyment, but that doesn't involve such a heavy footprint on the planet and on public health and on animals and so on. Um, in the same way that, let's say, digital photography it still enables us to capture our memories, but we just do it in a better way. Um, it's not saying we don't want photography. It's just saying we want a better way to take photos. Um, and I think with these alternative meat companies, Better Meat Co. included, there are new ways that we can replicate that experience of meat enjoyment that are just vastly better for the world and better for the consumer than the current ways that we're doing it. There's um, you know, a topic that comes up quite a bit and, and that's some of your analogies for kind of the way things are improving and, and changing. And, you know, and if you've listened to this show before or attended some of Paul's talks, you've definitely heard them, but kind of you know, ice versus, or I guess natural mm -hmm. ice versus artificial ice and, and all those things. And um, I, I think, you know, not to go into those examples now, but I think sure. it's, it's really nice to kind of, you know, see it from that perspective because you do kind of really put thought into how you phrase things and, and you have a newsletter that comes out every Friday. Thank you. So Yeah, I, I, I try to put things in ways that people understand. And so when you read the book Clean Meat, you'll see it might sound like, oh, this is going to be a really technical, science-y topic, but it's put in a way that is kind of more like pop sci and that's easier for a layperson to understand. It's not a difficult read. It's a very breezy read where you're reading the stories about the scientists rather than about the hardcore science. And in my own speaking, I think most of the time, people don't want to hear about things that they may perceive as either boring or over their head. They want to hear 
um, stories that they can relate to. And ice is a great example of that uh, because we did go from natural ice to so-called artificial ice. But there's lots of other examples of, of interesting ways that we were doing things in the past and now we have invented new ways to do them. Um, you know, everything from photography to how we watch movies. Um, you know, nobody sat around thinking, oh, like, you know, the VHS is horrible. It's just that streaming is so much better, right? Like, I mean, that's just what happened. And the same is so with meat. I don't think that most meat consumers are sitting around thinking that they hate meat. I think they think I love meat and never want to give it up. Um, but if a similar experience were offered to them that was better for them, better for the planet, better for animals and cost competitive and just as convenient, I, I think that you would see real changes when that starts occurring. And, and it may not be as far off. I mean, I, I am one of these people who see, has a hard time seeing how this happens rapidly. There's just so much capital um, expenditure that's needed. But I presume the CEO of Cargill knows more than I do about this. And in an interview this month, we're recording this in June 2021, in an interview this month, he said he thinks that alternative proteins may take up 10% of the meat market within three to four years from now. Three to four years. I mean, keep in mind, like, you know, Barclays and other experts uh, have been projecting that we get to that maybe within a decade from now, which I still thought was extremely optimistic. I mean, keep in mind, it's under 1% right now, you know, in terms of volume of meat sold. And to go to 10% in only a matter of a few years, even if it were a decade, that would still be pretty monumental. Um, but to see the Cargill CEO saying that he thinks it might be 10% by three to four years from now, uh, that gives me a lot of hope that, that there could be a, a rapid shift that will have some type of exponential growth phase here. Absolutely. And I think, you know, on that number, I think of, of milk and almond milk. And, and now if, if somebody is, has regular milk in their fridge, I, I kind of ask them like, oh, why? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I think, I think, you know, hopefully at that barbecue, you know, for example, you know, it'll be the same thing. Whereas, oh, why are you using this like, you know, animal agriculture type of real stuff you have? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you might not even call it the real stuff any more right. than we think of a digital photo as a fake photo, right? right. Like nobody says like, oh, like no nobody looks at this and they're like, oh, why don't you have a real phone? Yeah. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> this isn't a fake landline. I mean, this is a real phone. It's right. just doing something in a far different and better way. And so I suspect, I mean, I, I too have thought that when I see people who have cow's milk, I'm like, like it's almost, I, I mean, I know it's still the majority of the market, but in, and so maybe I live in a bubble, but when I see it, I'm like, don't you know? <laughs> like there's so many better options out there and they cost the same a lot of the time. Right. Um, so anyway, hopefully that will be the case with meat um, in the somewhat near future, but we're working hard to make it happen. And I'm excited to talk more about Riza, um, and well, actually, before I do, you know, another thing has changed over the last three years is that now there is a new podcast out there too. <laughs> uh, maybe not so new anymore, but um, you know, and and I, I'd I'd love to kind of get the synopsis um, for the audience, and if you haven't heard already, you'll you'll hear about it in just a second. Um, but in addition to your podcast, uh, the Business for Good podcast. There's also been a lot of other great podcasts that are popping up, and, and one of them, I think you were recently a guest on uh, Doug Grant's uh, Brave New Meat yes. podcast. Yeah, I, I am proud to say that I was the first guest on the Brave New oh, Meat yeah. podcast, <laughs> but I have since been on for a second episode, right. um, so I, I hope to three-peat sometime. Um, it, took t it took three years for me to get back on Cultured Meat and Future Foods, so hopefully less next time. But anyway, yeah, so first of all, I like Doug's podcast. I think it's, um, I, I, I enjoy it too. Um, I'm glad that he's doing that. And um, yeah, maybe you and Anita were the inspiration for Tony, my wife and I, to start our own podcast. So we started the Business for Good podcast, which is a show that basically features um, interesting folks, whether it be entrepreneurs or investors or even titans of industry who are using the power of their business to do good in the world, that they're solving some problem, whether it's everything from uh, topics relating to food production, to materials, to even like nuclear waste storage and so on. So um, it's been an exciting time. Sadly, Tony ceased her co-hosting after the first uh, 20 or so episodes. Um, and so now we're almost at uh, episode 70. Uh, so we have a, we must be coming out of a lower frequency than you guys. Um, but it's a, um, it, it's a fun time. It's a lot of work, as you know, I'm sure. 
Um, but I have been very gratified by it because people have told me who have come on, they've had their whole seed rounds funded uh, by going on the show. They've met other investors. They've met co-founders. Um, you know, every episode I always ask people what other companies they hope will get started so that other people will do that. So it's a good way to learn about new ideas that are out there. And um, I find it very inspirational to see people who are doing something really good in the world. Just to go back to the example of the person I was talking about earlier with the vegan fried chicken company, you know, uh, this is a, a woman named Deborah Torres. And Deborah just had a recipe for uh, vegan fried chicken that she really enjoyed. And she started making it for family and then she decided she's gonna make a website for it. And then she uh, just coincidentally got unsolicited, invited to participate at a festival. Next thing you know, she is at the National Fried Chicken Festival in New Orleans. I did not know there was such an And all plant-based. Uh, so hers, hers. hers is all plant-based. Yeah. She was the only all plant-based fried chicken to be invited to, to uh, be at the National Fried Chicken Festival, an obviously hallowed event that I did not know existed. <laughs> um, and she won the entire competition wow. at the whole festival of both all the fried chicken, the plant-based fried chicken out there. She won best fried chicken. Next thing you know, she's on Shark Tank and they offer a million dollars to buy her newly formed company. She turns them down, and now two years later, she's running her own business. She's never taken outside investment. She still owns 100% of the company, bootlegged the whole thing doing revenue, and this year, in 2021, she said that she's on track to bring in $5 million in revenue. Wow. So, you know, you think about these like amazing stories of entrepreneurs like that, and those are the type of stories that I want to help tell. Uh, whether it's through my writing or the podcast or other things like these are really incredible stories that deserve to be told Great and, and what I like about it is that it's not just kind of food focus It's really any type of you know group company or individual doing anything that's business for good Yes, so uh, to use the nuclear waste example that I mentioned um, I, I thought it was a really interesting company called deep isolation where they're basically uh, pioneering methods of storing nuclear waste in a safe manner that will be safe for like hundreds of millennia. And um, it's illegal right now for any private company to permanently dispose of nuclear waste. And so they're trying to get through that policy. Imagine being an entrepreneur trying to raise money for something that's currently <laughs> illegal to do. Right. <laughs> uh, but they are uh, pioneering this method that you can actually retrieve it. So even though it's stored safely, you could theoretically retrieve it if you needed to. Um, so you know, that's a really serious nuclear waste is a really serious problem. Not so, not many people think about it, but nuclear is probably going to be a part of a you know of a. Um, climate friendly solution since it's a, it's a very readily available source of energy that doesn't have, uh, that doesn't emit greenhouse gas emissions. And so there's a lot of waste that gets made. Like, how are you going to do that? Um, what are you, what are you going to do with it? It's dangerous. Right. So anyway, those are some interesting things. And, and yeah, so we also uh, recently had on um, the founder of a company making Pina Tex, which is a cool pineapple leather product. So they use agricultural waste from the pineapple industry. And are make... those the guys that have like really crazy like YouTube ads? I don't believe so, but oh. I don't know. There must be somebody else. Okay. I don't think, I don't think okay. they do that. But they did just partner with Nike to make a pineapple leather shoe, actually. Right. Yeah. I think I saw some info about that. Uh, yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, no, I appreciate that, Alex. Um, uh, I, I really enjoy doing Business for Good podcast because I think it's a good way to help hopefully inspire more people to get involved and make a difference through the power of the market. Um, I'm not saying that market solutions are the only solutions that work, obviously, but I do think that they're a particularly potent force for actually solving the problems that humanity is facing right now, which are extremely pressing and urgent. And uh, for those of you tuning in, uh, we'll put the show or the links in the show notes. Um, so keep an eye out for that or, or just go to the show description. Um, okay, cool. So we've, we've covered a lot of background topics, but I want to get back to that first question I asked you about where are we? Yes. And so, um, so we're in a, well, I, I have to be careful about what kinds of questions I ask because it's, it's not about size or anything like that. It's more about like what, yeah. right? Well, if you don't mind, why don't we just first talk about how plant-based meat is made today? Okay. So right now, you know, basically all, almost all plant-based meat is made from pea, wheat, or soy, or some combination of those three crops. And, you know, just take like uh, pea protein as an example, since it's so popular. You know, you need to grow a whole field of peas, then you got to harvest them, then you've got to dry them. And when you have that pea powder, 
it's only a little bit more than 20% protein, so it's not gonna cut it. So you've gotta fractionate it. So you get rid of the fiber and the fat, and you concentrate it down and isolate it into a pea protein powder that's now like 70 or 80% protein. And that's what we call a pea protein isolate. Yes, okay. that's a pea protein isolate. But even a pea protein isolate doesn't have the texture of meat. A pea protein isolate then gets texturized. So that means it goes through a, a high moisture twin screw extrusion process. That means essentially you're gonna take that powder, you're gonna subject it to high heat and high pressure, so hot that it's gonna turn it into a liquid, turn the powder into a liquid, and then it comes out of an extruder and it puffs up and this is what it becomes. So this is a, a texturized pea protein. This is what like the base ingredient of a Beyond Burger, for example, is. Now, when you eat this, what you'll notice when you eat texturized pea protein on a, just like this basis is that first of all, it doesn't taste good. Uh, second, it also uh, does not really become that meaty of a flavor. So you can, for example, here you go, you can try this, Alex. You do yeah. a little, there you go. Okay, here, let's so, try it. Yeah, so you can try that. So what you'll notice is that when you put it in your mouth and you start chewing it, it does not have a meaty type texture. I mean, it tastes more like flakes, almost like corn flakes to some extent. It's and actually not bad. I, I, don't, I don't dislike it, but yeah. it does have an off flavor. Like it has like a little bit of a bitter flavor. And that's why a lot of plant-based meat companies end up utilizing uh, masking agents to cover that up. Well, now you can try this. We're gonna talk about what this is, but this is Riza. So this is on a dry basis. So, you know, you can taste this, you can see here. This is Ryza. Put it in your other hand so you don't yeah. do that. There you go. Okay, and what you'll notice is when you start chewing it, the texture, well, let me, is it meatier? Yeah, it's, it's totally different. Right, dramatically meatier. And you'll notice it has really no flavor. Like it's very mm -hmm. neutral in its flavor. So what we are offering at Better Meat Co. Is, a, is an ingredient that just from the very beginning, before you do anything to it, already is meatier and better tasting than let's say texturized pea protein. So that texturized pea protein had a million things that happened to it before you got to it right now, right? It was, you know, uh, milled and fractionated and isolated and extruded and it got to that stage. What you tried with the Ryza, all that happened was we removed the water. It came out of the fermenter, we removed the water and you ate it. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that has happened to that uh, product before entering your mouth. So now let's back up and say how we make this, right? So with um when you're thinking about like plants they're very far away from animals on the evolutionary tree right and then you have this entirely other kingdom of fungi and the fungi are much closer to animals than they are to plants this is why mushrooms have a meatier flesh than plants do you know it's very common to use mushrooms and uh, as a meat substitute because they are so much closer to animals their flesh is just literally more similar to animals flesh than to plants flesh in fact fungi are so much closer to animals than to plants that like us they breathe in oxygen and breathe out co2 so you think about like a plant and we know trees breathe in co2 and put out oxygen that's why everybody's like oh you know help solve climate change plant more trees and so on well fungi do the opposite they breathe in oxygen like animals and they breathe out CO2. That's how much closer they are to us. So what we do here at the Better Meat Co. is we take common ingredients like potatoes and we subject them to a very special kind of fermentation where our microflora, which are fungi in nature, consume that product and in their consumption of it, they basically grow up and become something that we call Ryza. And Ryza is a mycoprotein ingredient that is meatier and better tasting than other products that you might use, like what you just tried. In addition, it's way better for you. So it's more nutritious, it's a whole food, there's no fractionation, no isolation, no extrusion, this is a whole food that has more protein than eggs, more iron than meat, more potassium than bananas, more fiber than oats, and it naturally contains vitamin B12, unlike any plant food. Because when you're dealing, you know, B12 comes from microbes, so this is a microbial fermentation. So this is a true superfood in like every sense of the word. And it is also cost-effective. 
we're able to produce Ryza in less than a day. So from the moment that our fermenter begins the process where the microflora start consuming the nutrients that they're eating, in less than a day, we are turning that over and harvesting them and then turning them into something like this. So we are building the most sustainable, the most efficient, the most nutritious animal-free protein that is out there, which happens to be also a complete protein containing all essential amino acids. So we really believe that we're creating the future of the next generation, really, of animal-free proteins. Is there anybody else doing something like this, for example, in Impossible Burger or Impossible Foods or, or Beyond Meat? I mean, they're using the pea protein isolate, aren't they? Well, uh, Beyond Meat uses pea protein isolate. Um, Impossible Foods uses a soy protein isolate, which is a similar process, but obviously with soy, not pea. Um, but the company that is doing something comparable is Corn, Q U O R N. And, you know, Corn is a company that I really highly admire. They're a really cool company that's been around for decades. And they were acquired back in 2015 for about $800 million. And they are producing great products that are made from mycoprotein. Um, so, those products are good um, and I enjoy them. In fact, I ate corn earlier today. Um, but, uh, you know, they're a branded CPG company. Um, you know, for them, they're, they're more interested in selling you frozen products in the supermarket, um, whereas we are an ingredient provider to other companies so they can make better products themselves. And that's a key distinction. There's other distinctions too, um, but I don't want to be that different from corn since they've been extremely successful. But uh, that's a company that's doing something similar. I see. Okay. Yeah, and corn, I mean, when kind of looking at alternative protein products, corn is one that oftentimes does have egg in some of their products. So it's, from a CPG standpoint, it's something that at least I overlook when I'm looking for new kind yeah. of plant-based stuff. Yeah, there are several uh, totally vegan corn lines, um, including their spicy chicken patties that you can get here in Northern California, but most of their products have eggs as a binder, and that's definitely um, you know an annoyance to me for sure. I, I don't buy those products, but I do buy their vegan products, and I really like them. But they are, you know, it, it's fascinating because, I mean, when you think about cool technologies that people are doing, like uh, they're at the small scale, and we're like these companies are raising huge sums of money, like. Corn is running an actual gigantic biomass fermentation facility in the UK where they have numerous 150,000 liter bioreactors operating. I mean, it's an incredible story of the success of this company. Yeah, and um, you know, you mentioned that they were recently acquired. I think they've started kind of being a little bit more in the conference circuit since that uh, was it you said 2016? I think they were acquired in 2015. 2015. Okay. Yeah, but but they have also I have noticed in more recent years that I've seen more and more of them. And, and I should say um, to their credit, their CEO sent me an extremely gracious email when we made our announcement about this factory. It's very kind of him. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I you know I look up to Corn a lot, and I hope we can grow to be as big as they are and make make the type of difference as a, as an ingredient company that they're making as a CPG company. So the product that we just tried, so is that kind of like the core ingredient that you then sell to other either food service or food manufacturers? Well, so what you tried is just pure dried Ryza. We can actually prepare Ryza in a lot of different ways. So we can turn it into a steak, we can turn it into a chicken breast, we can turn it into any type of ground meat product from burgers to nuggets to crab cakes and more. So it's very versatile in its application, whether you want to do ground meat, whether you want to do um, whole muscle mimicry, whether you want to blend it into animal meats to hybridize those meats, or you want to create fully plant-based meat. It is very malleable as an ingredient. So what you tried is the easiest thing for us to do, which is just dry it down and leave it as a shelf-stable ingredient. But we can also keep that moisture in there and use it for other types of products as well as a hydrated product. And so Better Meat Co. has always had this model that um, you sell to kind of um, groups that end up putting a final product in with actual meat to right. kind of enhance the flavor profiles. Um, but, I mean, that tasted pretty good, and that was like the raw version. I'd love to throw some oil and some <laughs> chopped onions in a pan, right, and make tacos. But, oh, yeah. um, you know, we also tried the... Uh, kind of like the burger when it, there was the opening. And so 
Is the model still to act as an enhancer to actual meat, or is it something that could be completely standalone? It's both. So we, we have what we call a classic line of products, and that is a line that we've been selling now for a couple of years. It's based on a pea protein and, and other proteins. And those ingredients do get used currently by customers of ours that are doing both animal-based and plant-based meat. So they use them as the basis of a fully plant-based meat and they'll put them into their animal-based meats. The, the company was really founded for the purpose of helping food companies use fewer animals. Like our goal, you know, we don't sell meat, but we sell to companies that use our products in their meat products. And the goal was, how can we help the food industry use fewer animals? And so I'm a big believer in blending for that very reason. I really think that we should be helping the food industry use fewer animals, whether that means they're going to add plant-based options or blend into their default items as well. As an example, we sell to Purdue Farms. They do a product called Purdue Chicken Plus, and that's a 50-50 blend, plant-based and, um, and chicken. And that product is in 7,100 grocery stores. It's performed very well for Purdue. Um, it was named the best tasting frozen chicken nugget in America by the Food Network. And it's now grown from 0% of their sales a couple years ago to now 20% of their frozen chicken nugget sales. So you know, it's pretty remarkable that for a massive company like Purdue, 20% of their frozen chicken nugget sales are a 50-50 hybrid blend. So uh, that's the type of thing I think that we can help big food companies use fewer animals. And that's great. But I understand that Ryza is so much better than the plant proteins that are available today that there is a high demand for fully plant-based usage of it to improve the plant-based meats that are out there. Uh, so for example, um, the Plant-Based Seafood Co., which is another startup that does, as you can imagine, plant-based seafood, um, they really like it and want to uh, put out crab cakes later on this year that are fully plant-based crab cakes with it. Um, with rising? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, but also, you know, we, in our press release when we announced the product, uh, Johnsonville Sausage was quoted in there about how promising they find it as well. So there's lots of options for us here, um, and demand is already dramatically outstripping supply at this moment. Um, but we're going to build a full-scale plant. This is just a demonstration plant. You know, in, in fermentation, you have like four different scales. You've got bench scale, pilot scale, demonstration scale, and then full scale. This is our demonstration scale plant. This is our corporate headquarters. It's our R&D headquarters. And we want to sell the products that we make here, but you know we're still limited to being only able to produce thousands of pounds a month here. We need to be able to produce hundreds of thousands of pounds a month. And that'll be our next plant that we're gonna build. Wow, okay. And I mean, this facility looks big, but when you think about really I guess what commercial scale, what was the last scale? Full scale, yeah. Full scale. Yeah. When you look at kind of you know other operations and you know the industry, the cultured meat industry, cultivated meat industry always makes the reference to beer brewing. And I mean those tanks, those facilities are insanely huge. Yeah. So, yeah. so could you imagine a world where we do have a facility that big producing Ryza? We're, we're in the process of designing it as we speak. Um, we want a river of Ryza flowing through the food industry. And so actually, um, uh, the firm that helped us to build this facility, uh, speaking of beer, they also do Sierra Nevada's um, brewing sites. And so, you know, we view ourselves not as a niche company seeking to sell this high margin product where we want to remain as, you know, on the fringe. I mean, we want to create a commodity ingredient that can really help displace meat in the market. And I think Ryza is that opportunity for us to do that. So the next plant, which will be an order of magnitude larger than this one, uh, will be producing huge amounts, millions of pounds a year of Ryza, and then we'll go from there. Wow. And we were talking about that 10%, right? Uh, maybe Ryza is going to be a huge contributor to getting that 10%. I certainly would be gratified if that were true, but even if we contributed to a fraction of a percent, it would still be pretty good considering that today the entire plant-based meat industry is still a fraction of a percent of the total meat industry. Um, you know, it, you know, it's important to look at it in volume, not just dollars, because people say, oh, it's like 1% in the dollar value. But what's important is because plant-based meat is typically sort of multiples over the cost of animal-based meat. So you're really interested from a sustainability perspective is like the total number of pounds. And when you look at the total number of pounds of animal meat produced in the United States alone versus the total number of pounds of plant-based meat in the United States alone, you're still at far less than 1%, sadly. 
there's just a really long way to go. Um, but we got to start somewhere, and the problems that we face are extremely urgent. We're sitting here in California where fire season is no longer a season. It's just all year round. Water is dwindling. We know that raising animals for food is a driving factor in a lot of the environmental uh, problems that we face today. So for us, speed is of the essence. We feel like we really are on a mission to help reform the food industry to help the food industry leave a much lighter footprint. Yeah, and I think when you look at speed and what your team has accomplished, I mean, that episode three years ago in 2018, I think that was before Better Meat Co. was officially founded, right? When we recorded, yeah, that's right. In fact, when it aired, it was true also. So, uh, yeah, that's right. I think it aired in April of 2018. I don't think we incorporated it until May of 2018. So, yeah, yeah, it's a remarkable... um, and I'm also particularly heartened that you all now have moved to our area. So we're psyched to have you as neighbors. And, and so we're in West Sacramento now, and Anita and I are actually not too far. And it's actually interesting that we're starting to see more companies move out here, some of them cult- in, the, in the cellular agriculture space. Yeah. So, you know, we you referenced our ribbon cutting that we did earlier in June, where there were more than 100 people, many of them from the alternative protein industry here. Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute gave a great speech here. Our mayor gave a very nice speech. I got to cut you off because, and I saw Bruce there, and I'm, I went up to Bruce and I said, you know, I knew this was was a big event and I was really excited to come, but it wasn't until I saw, and, and the mayor of West Sacramento was here, which was also very nice, but I told Bruce, it wasn't until I saw your name that I'm like, okay, wow, this is a really big event. <laughs> so, He's a big name. He's an American food hero. So, um, yeah, so uh, um, that is a reference to Eating Well magazine named him the American food hero recently, which is very well deserved. Um, awesome but, photo, too. Yeah, yeah, it was a really cool photo. I loved that. But anyway, the point is that there were a lot of people from the alternative protein industry at that ribbon cutting, and I cannot tell you how many of them asked me questions about being in Yellow County, oh. saying like, you know, what do you pay per square foot? Like, because they're, you know, it, you don't have to be in San Francisco. I mean, it's just a myth. I'm not against being in San Francisco, but you know, we're paying out here typically like a dollar per square foot, whereas over there they're generally closer to six dollars a square foot. And for what? And the argument would be, oh, well, you know, you got to be close to the Silicon Valley investors. Well, we're still close enough here. But second, I mean, a huge amount of the money that's funding the space is no longer in Silicon Valley. Even the VC world is diversified, uh, geographically speaking, around. So um, then the question is, well, can you attract talent outside of San Francisco? And what we found is a lot of people don't want to live in San Francisco. It's just too expensive. And the quality of life is just way better uh, out here, honestly. I mean, uh, my wife and I, work hard to give our dog a better life and we think he has a better life here than he would there so um i I just don't really understand the lore of being in in in, uh san francisco or or the east bay right now given the pricing situation um it's not to say i'm against it i just think here is a good place to be i think the the pandemic has made that true more than ever i think um you know we're starting to see a lot of the sand held road vcs either you know move to Miami or Raleigh Durham or all these like other areas um, and you know they still kind of come back and the you know Sand Hill Road will always be Sand Hill Road um, but uh, but yeah I think the, the pandemic has also allowed people to have more capability to, to spread out and that's kind yeah. of why we spread out so yeah oh well, that's great I'm sure you have a higher quality of life here but um, yeah, I, I don't think it's possible for me to go on Twitter without seeing my friend Ryan Bethencourt chowting the Raleigh Durham area. <laughs> he's like, he's, he's like an evangelist. I hope the tourism board is like paying him there, <laughs> like the Chamber of Commerce or somebody. Well, uh, well I, I don't know if Ryan listens to this show, but he's Anita and I have been like looking to book a ticket out there because he's selling us. I don't know. I'm, wow, I'm it's working! You, it's so working! It's working! Well, he's a smart guy. I think that you know he he knows something is up. So, well, we're coming up on time. I wanted to kind of have the last question really be about any announcements or kind of <clears throat> insights that you'd like to share either from Better Meat Co. or some of your other uh, kind of projects and initiatives? Sure. I mean, one thing that I would just point out is that um, there's lots of ways uh, to, uh, to peel a potato, let's say. So, you know, um, I hate using animal unfriendly terms like lots of ways to skin a cat. I have no desire to skin a cat. So there's lots of ways to peel a potato. And 
uh, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who are trying to, let's say, reduce the cost of extrusion to make uh, or to, you know, genetically select plants like peas to have higher protein content or to uh, breed them to not have the off flavors that they're producing and so on. I think all of that is fantastic. But the microbial world really does offer us lots of opportunities to very efficiently produce new types of products that can work really, really well. And so like if you think about why are we able to produce Ryza in a matter of hours and the reason is because you know you think about like an or the size of the organism generally the bigger the longer it takes to replicate right so like a whale takes a really long time to produce more whales so an elephant takes a long time to produce more elephants um, cows take a while and then you get down to pigs and they're less time and chickens even less time and rats and mice can replicate themselves very rapidly well, when you start getting into the microscopic level, though, you're talking about, you know, hours to replicate as opposed to weeks or months or years before they can replicate. And so we can produce huge amounts of product in a very short amount of time. And that enables us to open up an entirely new and novel type of meat production that's really efficient and that can compete on cost in ways that I think is harder to when you're dealing with, um, with other um, things like entire plants, as an example. Uh, so I, when I think about meat alternatives, so often we think about obviously cultivated meat and plant-based meat. Well, there, there is this entire other world out there that's not necessarily plant-based, so to speak. I mean, colloquially it's plant-based, but these are not technically plants, they're fungi. And I think that there's so much room for exploration because m most of those species have never even been explored. Um, you know, a lot of them have never even been named. And you know, just to take corn as an example, you know, they got an organism that no human had ever consumed before. And they ran enormous numbers of safety tests on it, showed that it is safe to consume, and now they have a thriving business based on selling that. And that produced an entirely novel culinary experience for people. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like cheese, uh, where you know, if you think about like, you know, no human really had had cheese until only a few thousand years ago. Um, sure, people had been drinking cow's milk for thousands of years prior to that, but nobody had really ever had cheese because nobody had figured out how to make milk curdle. So nobody had ever fantasized or dreamt of Gouda or Brie or Swiss or cheddar or whatever. Um, and with corn, they took an organism that they then turned into this product through fermentation that nobody had ever eaten before. And it doesn't, I don't think it tastes like meat, honestly. I just think it tastes like an entirely different category of food in the way that cheese doesn't taste, you know, nobody says, oh, like cheese, yeah, it kind of tastes like tofu. Like nobody says that, you know, <laughs> it's just a new food and people love cheese. They love it a lot. Um, and just like I love corn, I think corn is a really great product. And I, what we're trying to do is to replicate meat here, but we can also use this for um, this, meaning microbial fermentation, to make lots of really cool, interesting, novel culinary experiences for humans that will have a much lower footprint, but also are just really interesting. And so I'm excited about exploring and, and hopefully popularizing this method of protein production because I think there's just such an untapped world out there of microbial fermentation that can really do a lot of good for the planet and enrich our lives personally at the same time. So if there's a startup listening and they want to create a, I guess, a Ryza based food, is that an option? Contact us. We'll get you some samples. We'd love to work with you on it. Could be the next wave of uh, food products. Well, we hope so. Paul, thank you so much for being a, a guest your second time around on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. It is my great honor. I love the show and thank you very much. This is your host, Alex, and we have Anita uh, doing the tech behind the scenes and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know the pandemic is over when you do an actual handshake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>